Thanks for joining us again uh, for a very special episode. This is number 127 of the Clive Barker podcast. Uh, This interview took a little bit of time to arrange, but we're really happy about it. Uh, Chris Velasco, uh, you may know him from his score for Clive Barker's Jericho, the the video game from 2007. Uh, So he has some great stories about uh, working with Clive Barker and what it's like to be a um, a music composer for for, uh, video games. And he talks about the other projects, some other projects that he's working on. And before we get to that, there's a whole bunch of news to get caught up on as well. So, um, all coming up on episode 127 of the Clive Barker Podcast. The first part, we're going to talk about news, and then we're going to get into our special interview with uh, Chris Velasco, the composer for Clive Barker's Jericho. That's right. He also worked a lot of, uh, in a lot of other AAA games, uh, but... Uh, You'll hear all that in yeah. our intro before we start our interview. And and normally I talk about this in the in the uh, intro, but I before we you know get together. But I wanted to kind of tell you guys about this. Um, Don Bertram from Celebrate Imagination. Mm-hmm. I yes. bought my my business Christmas cards from him. So he was you know normally he only sells you know a few of these, but I bought two hundred and fifty. And nice. they're awesome. And he was super generous. He, he Not only did he send me the, the Christmas cards that I bought, but he sent me some Clive Barker art prints that were autographed. Oh, amazing. Yeah. And That's we're not so generous on, of him. We're not on video now, which is kind of ironic because we were just on video. But, yeah, I've got one that's 23 out of 50, uh, number 23 out of 50. And then I'll have to maybe take some pictures of these. Oh, and uh, a print of... You know the one that's the hand with the sort of tentacle arm coming out of it with the eyeball? Uh, yeah, yeah. And like a starry night behind it. So I got a, mm-hmm. I got a print of that one, too, that's number 50 out of 50. Oh, awesome. That's uh, the cover of a, a theater playbook, right? Yeah, yeah. Uh, Forms of Heaven, I think, right? Or right. Incarnations. I can't remember which one is which. Okay. Yeah. And he sent me uh, like a press invitation card for the the launch of the Imagica trading card game. Oh, cool! From the yeah. Zahara Pushu yeah company yeah. And I, I I'm trying to find it here, but yeah. So I can I can hear you. I can hear you like uh, opening up all through. those. Yeah. Yeah, wrestling through all that stuff. Here it is. Goodies there, Ryan. Yeah, I was I, I was super happy, and I wanted to say thank you to Don if you're listening to this. It says yeah. Harper Collins and L- the Lost Souls invite you to, to invite you to help celebrate the release of Clive Barker's Imagica. Uh, guest of honor is Clive Barker, and this was in Atlanta, Georgia, in uh, June 27th, 1997. Wow! Will you look at that? It's a That's pri- amazing. private reception. Pretty cool. So uh, that's going right back into the baggie. Mm-hmm. <laughs> so the, yeah, <laughs> and and I did want to say um, for people, who, I'm sure people have heard this, but uh, Don Bertram's Celebrate Imagination is dedicated to benefiting the arts and medicine program at Texas Children's Hospital. So up to fifty percent of the proceeds when you buy his prints or books uh, support that program, and he volunteers yeah, but- he volunteers on it every month. The Texas Children's Cancer Center, which yeah. it's it's a wonderful thing to support. I mean, I've seen, I've been to a uh, pediatric cancer ward. It's it's a very a depressing experience, but also a very inspiring experience because you get to see all those little kids there walking around with no hair, but they're just you know they're just fighting just as hard as any other adult, and they deserve all the support they can get. Yeah. And there's a link in the show notes on the main website at clivebarkercast.com where you can click on it. That'll take you to where you can buy his prints on his Etsy page or get an art book and help out this wonderful program. And, of course, any friend of Clive Barker's is a friend of ours, and we thank Don for his support. That's right. All right, so in the news... Um, first, I guess first off, talking about... Uh, the, the Departed, right? It's also known as Hermione and the Moon. Uh, uh-huh. Now is going to be in the Cemetery Dance Anthology, Dark Screams. Cool, uh, because this story is pretty rare. And uh, yeah. it's always nice. Yeah. Uh, I don't think I've read it as well. I mean, Ryan, you sent me one book once. I think that was uh, 
It had something to do with the uh, Chiliad, I think. <clears throat> no, I think it was. I I thought it was uh, Primeval. And oh yeah, that's Primeval, right? The one it, with the did, woman. Yeah. Did it have this one on it? This story? That's the. It's the one no. where. Uh, it's the same as the Departed, where where the the um, right. The the one uh, Hermione is dead, and and she's watching her husband and her kid. I haven't had a chance to read it yet, oh, but okay. I think wasn't it available in script form when they adapted it to a to a, a script? Yeah, yeah, it was. I think so. I need yeah. to download that and read it again because I this is one of those stories that kind of escaped me, but uh, it's great. Maybe this time I'll buy the Cemetery Dance anthology to read it. And very um, uh, haunting title to it, so it intrigues, it intrigues me. Mm-hmm. Yeah, it's a it's a good book. It's a little sad. It's about you know people that are dead and you know watching the living go on with their yeah. lives. Yeah, I believe the Departed was the uh, original title, but then someone told Clive that it was too depressing, and so he re- <laughs> changed it to Hermione and the Moon. Yeah, I think so. Uh, yeah, and, and it depends on it depends on which book you're reading it in, what which title it has. It's it, so it can be confusing. Yeah. And for Harry Demore fans out there, the uh, one of Harry Demore's first stories, Lost Souls, is going to come out from uh, uh, Titan Books, Dark Detectives. So it'll feature the story Lost Souls there. And for people that may not have realized or don't remember, Titan Books put out the uh, Nightbreed uh, Chronicles and the Hellraiser Chronicles, right? Um, yes, I think so. Yeah, that's right. Yeah, so it's it was been a, a, a British company. It's been a long time since they since they had uh, did something Clive Barker related. And that's kind of neat. And, and it's edited by Stephen Jones as well. This is a uh, only a U.S. and Canada only release, so just let people that oh overseas uh, that listen to us know that it, that was kind of a bummer. And Lost Souls has appeared in a few books, but you can actually also find it online at the old Clive Barker um, site, uh, clivebarker dot com. Yeah, it got reposted on the internet uh, after that as well. I mean, there was okay. an online magazine that uh, ended up reposting that story. Actually, I'm trying to figure out uh, what was that. Uh, it was uh, Nightmare Magazine, I think. Oh, uh, yes, I'll add the link to the show notes. Cool. Yeah, I always wanted to collect it. So for me, having it on a website was like okay, but you know, I still wanted a book to put on the shelf that had that story in it. Ideally, it would be nice if, if Clive Barker collected all of these sort of straggler stories and put them together into a book. Yeah. Well, he wanted to do that since the early 90s. Uh, <clears throat> that's when the Scarlet Gospels idea started to take form. Uh, yeah. He always wanted to make like a Books of Blood Volume 2. <laughs> yeah. Well, or Volume 7, I should say. But... Uh, so, it's, it's, yeah, I guess it's coming at some point. In the yeah. meantime, we have all these little stragglers being republished in anthologies, which yeah. anthologies are always great ways to to get to know other authors. So they're great gateways into, like, I, I think I, I started learning about Poppy Z. Bright and uh, uh, William Boyd and uh, other horror writers in uh, anthologies, you know. Yeah. Like, uh, yeah, me too. I found mm-hmm. out. Ramsey Campbell, too, was a good one I found out, who was a big inspiration for Clive. Oh, yeah, same here. Yeah. Actually, I, yeah, I, I discovered Ramsey Campbell because of Clive Barker, even though he's a you know an older author. I first, uh, first story I've ever read of Ramsey Campbell was a story called Again, I think. It's about a guy who finds a, a, an old couple living in a house, and uh, there's more to it than he can, you know see at first sight but uh it's it's a really creepy story uh, another story of clive's pigeon and teresa is in a new anthology called shining in the dark and pigeon and teresa is one of my favorite of these straggler stories because it's only um i think well you can only find it i think in the london time out london book of hor- of uh of short horror stories or something like that time out london book time of out short book stories. of london short stories <clears throat> Yeah, and um, so it it took me a long time to track that down on eBay, and I finally got one, and I love that story, and maybe because I looked for it for so long, but uh, but it's neat. It's it's about an angel that comes down from Earth to do apotheosis, right? He's turning a a regular person into an angel, and uh, but he but he doesn't realize that this person's pets were around, 
And so he sort of gives these pets the power of, like, speech. And so oh. now now there's these sort of self-aware, a turtle and a, and a parrot sort of running around trying to avoid, uh, you know, this angel coming back to erase his mistake. That's so cool. I mean, yeah. Clive, <laughs> Clive had that story um, about that earthquake thing. Um, animal life. Where, animal life, where he also uh, has some animals that start talking uh, out of some sort of divinity figure that, that touches them. So it's interesting how Clive likes to uh, to do that with animals and, and make them, you know, touched by the divine. Yeah, yeah, exactly. Um, oh, the Nightbreed Archive was that. That was a um, that was a, a, a publishing by uh, Boom, right? Is Boom is it Boom Studios that's putting together all of the old '90s Nightbreed comics? Yeah, uh, uh, yeah, yeah, they yeah. Are. So there was a free preview of that. I don't know. That was back in September. So it's still <laughs> up there, I think. Okay, Pre- it, it Previews World. It's a comic book site that alters, you know. Pre- free previews i think of the comics and and like all of these news stories we'll have a link in the show notes here but uh, yeah uh infernal parade so this was an interesting one because uh i I maybe due to the success of the tortured souls book now there's an infernal parade book that you can pre-order i've pre-ordered mine already although uh if if somebody's expecting it to be like tortured souls it's not exactly the same right it, this is not a continuous story yeah it's um it's basically the stuff that came with the figurines so yeah. the, the the blurb and the the tiny little bio and um before this book uh was published or, or is set to be published you could still find this in in blogs around the internet where you could find a little story of uh you know, uh, Tom Requiem or whatever the the character is, and and all the other characters, but they they're very very short short little bios, um, mm-hmm. little colorful bios for the characters. So, I'm guessing they're going to pad this out with uh, some art and some sketches or something. That's probably what's going to be yeah. more attractive for people who have the Infernal Parade figurines. And that cover image is really neat too, it's like some some big scary bird monster on the front. Yeah, mm-hmm. I was, that's what got me. I never looked. I'm never. I don't know anything about the Infernal Parade, so that I got me either. curious because uh, I got me curious with that. Uh, yeah, that big bird like dragon looking thing. Yeah. So, um, this is kind of neat. There's a um, and I discovered this because of uh, just a conversation, an email conversation I had with one of our listeners. But it turns out there is a trade paperback second edition of Maximilian Bacchus. Oh really? Oh, yeah, yeah. I saw that in the news. I didn't. I didn't even know they had a paperback. Of yeah, it. it actually came out last year, and we missed it somehow. But um, but yeah, you can go. Um, is it Bad Mood Books? I think you can go buy them. Yes. Oh, and, cool. And, and there was a limited amount, only a thousand, and I don't. I I don't know if. I think they're not all sold out yet. Well, this book is twenty nine dollars, and there are only two hundred copies, not a thousand. Two hundred. Oh, okay. Wow. Yeah, yeah, but there are still more left. So for anybody, I, and you know, occasionally we see people complaining online about how they want to buy Maximilian Bacchus, but people on eBay are are asking outrageous prices for it. <laughs> yeah. So this would be a way, you know, you can buy this one <laughs> right now, and then if and then keep on looking for a a, a better deal on the hardcover. Sure. Or sure. a while, a little while back, I thought I saw on. Um... Official real club workers site. They were selling the hardcovers for like twenty bucks. Wow! But they could. That be would be that, a steal. Yeah, it would yeah, be. Yeah, that's they're amazing. not. They're not. They're not signed, but they're they're only twenty bucks. You but know, they could have been sold out now. That was and, a while back. And I think that uh, I think that people sort of forget to check there because uh, there's always a ton of interesting stuff and it's always changing. Yeah. So this is very attractive because it's second printing, but it's signed and it's relatively affordable, twenty nine dollars, and it came out in September of this year. And like you said, Ryan, I mean, we're kind of redeeming ourselves because we we missed it, I guess. But uh, now we're, we're letting you guys know it's still available. Yeah. At the badmoonbooks.com website, so go there and check it out. And uh, speaking of more special edition books, uh, the Last Illusion. Is is actually going to be um, printed by Fiddleblack in in a mm-hmm. single single volume of the short story. 
that that uh, yeah. Lord of Illusions was based on. So we yeah. we talked to Fiddle Black in 2013 when they made Cabal and other annotations during the height of uh, Occupy Midian and stuff. That's right. We did. We did talk to them, and uh, I made an v- unboxing video on our YouTube channel of yeah. the Fiddle Black Cabal and other annotations. That was a pretty interesting book uh, with some very interesting addendums and uh, <laughs> yeah. And, yeah. and essays in it that you can read. Um, yeah. So, yeah, this time it's uh, – it's the popular books of blood story, the, the last illusion. So, you know, I'm kind of iffy about these like single standalone editions of, of books of blood stories, but yeah, I guess it's, if you can't find it or if, if you're a completist, you go ahead and get it because this is limited to 350 copies and it costs $33. Yeah. Oh, wow. That's, not much, but... That's a good price. Yeah. Sure. <laughs> it says here, along with the story, you'll also find some insight and essays from American magician and illusionist Chris Angel. Um, okay. high, <laughs> Chris Angel? The, <laughs> the, high, the high priest of the Church of Satan, Peter H. Gilmore, who also wrote an essay for the, the Cabal book. Yeah. I guess they have him on retainer there at Fiddleblack. <laughs> yeah. And the Satanic Temple co-founder and spokesperson, Lucian Greaves, as well as Barker historians Phil and Sarah Stokes. And Lord of Illusions special effects artist Alan McFarland. So which one so, of those uh, two guys is is in, is ahead of the other one? Like which one is the boss of the Satanic Church? I have church? no idea. Probably <laughs> Peter H. Gilmore. Yeah, he's yeah. the high priest. So the high priest. <laughs> the other is the co-founder and spokesperson. So oh. I don't think they have any leaders. It's uh, yeah. yeah. So so there you go. Um, the last illusion. Yeah. Get it. Yep, yeah, and uh, I think is that. You can. Oh, that's right. They said they've already been selling them. So, the, mm-hmm. if I remember right, Fiddle Black didn't do pre-orders, right? They just they tease something for a while, and then bam, it's available, and you can buy it until it's gone. And it's like yep. comes out on a le- the twenty fifth of this month. Oh, does it? So it is. Yeah. It, it is a little bit of a pre-order then, but not like super long pre-order like we've been doing with some of these other books. Right. So it's 350 and I'm looking at the order page right now. With shipping, it's probably $38. It, you know, if you're a completist, I guess this will be interesting for you, especially if you're a big Harry Moore fan. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Uh, and some more uh, contributions by Clive Barker. We've got uh, Mirror Mirror 2 is going to have some artwork of his. And I don't know much about this one, Rob. Do you know which art is going to be in there? Yes, it's the Death and the Maiden. Oh, okay. Picture. Oh, yeah. That's what he's providing for. And that's that's on the inside, not on the cover, I'm guessing. Yes, I believe so. Okay. Uh, it's a, What I wrote down from my notes here, I was like, it's a comic book anthology which brings new comics and drawings from various talented people, including huh. Clive himself. And it's uh, in the report, it has all the people that, you know, are involved I didn't. I didn't notice any anybody familiar except Clive. Yeah, so. I was reading that too, and I I don't I don't know, know those names. They're going to be some pretty strong, uh, powerful drawings. Uh, a lot of horror stuff. A little bit of you know erotica, gothic yeah. stuff. And uh, I think it's great that at the end of your uh, article you wrote via Clive Barker Revelations and Attention Deficit Disorderly website. So that's what? a great name for a website. <laughs> Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, Death and the Maiden is a kind of a black and white uh, picture that uh, Clyde Barker painted where there was a skeleton uh, pleasuring a woman. And it's it's a pretty cool image. I yeah, we go go check out the article that Rob wrote and uh it looks great. It was back in September. I know it's taken a little while for us to do a news episode, but uh it's still available. This uh I think it's stuff Clive likes to do cuz he loves that underground kind of stuff. And that's what this is, I think, was kind of going to more underground kind of comics. That yeah. Are, yeah. Pushed the envelope, like yeah. sex and violence. Yeah, like Fly in My Eye, I think, had some Clive Barker art in it. Yeah. A long time There's ago. also a book called uh, Meat Hook Up My Rectum <laughs> that Clive Barker contributed to. Oh, jeez. <laughs> yeah, I remember I that. that. Oh. Yeah. Anyway, so uh, this comes out in the first quarter of 2017, apparently. Ah. There we go. I got to update that sidebar that says when all the things are coming out because there's a lot of new stuff. Okay, we're so, catching up. 
Yeah. Yeah, it, there, well, there, are, there are always so many little releases nowadays. Um, the body book has an alternate cover. So this cover, I liked the first one that they showed, but this alternate cover looks like a, a photograph by Clive Barker. Looks like yeah. something from his uh, Imagining Man. Yeah, yeah, exactly. I like the new cover. Uh, the first cover I thought was a little too blue for me. I was like, eh, it's okay. And then there was that uh, sketch that was kind of transparent over it, and I was like, sure. I would like to either see the sketch or, you know, just, just have oh, something gotcha. different. So I, I'm glad that they changed it to uh, to the picture. I think it looks more appropriate. And it's a Clyde Barker picture, so. Yeah. Yeah. It fits so the it, tone of the stories. Yeah, and play. it's going to have... Again, some some already published stories uh, from the Books of Blood, which seems to be, you know, uh, very popular. So it's got the body politic and in the flesh. Uh, the body politic was that story with the hands. And in the flesh is that story that takes place in the prison. Um, so it's, it's a pretty creepy story. One of the creepiest stories of the Books of Blood. So if you haven't read that one, get this book. You'll be getting a couple of good stories. Uh, also, there's a limited edition of Everville coming out soon. Um, and who is the pub? Oh, Gauntlet Press. Gauntlet is, Press. Is, they're doing yeah. that. So they're doing that. They did the Great Secret Show. Yeah, yeah. And, like the limited edition. I'm sure they'll come up with some cool features, uh, like like sketches or behind the scenes or notes or essays or whatever. So that's the thing about these re-releases of old. Clyde Barker stuff is that usually they add something to it to make it more interesting if you already have the original book. Yeah, yeah. I mean, uh, there. I, it'll be nice to see when when it's available, what the cover is going to look like, what they'll include, and and of course the price. But always mm -hmm. always want to know the price. Yep. I wonder if uh, I was curious if uh, that'd be gone press. Uh, maybe could be. Plant could release the last book of that series. Could they do that, or are they just a uh, niche? Well, he's got to uh, finish it first. <laughs> well, yeah, yeah. No, I mean, I'm just saying. Yeah, maybe it's something, under, it's something they, under the table, you know. It's being, they they may I mean, they may be able to oh. because I I kind of I kind of think it that uh, it seems like Harper Collins has sort of released Clive Barker from their uh, contract. Mm -hmm. So now they're only uh, doing the Abrad books, I think. Yeah. Yeah. So, I mean, I think it'd be just they might put it out to bid or maybe they had a really good experience with um, with uh, St. Martin's Press. Maybe they would work with them again. I have no idea. Yeah. Who knows? That thing is still far away, I guess. Even though yeah. Clive has said a few years ago that uh, he now finally figured out how to finish the trilogy of the arts. <laughs> yeah, that still but could be in he, 10 yeah. years from now. Yeah, but, <laughs> you know, he, he rewrites his things a lot and... Um, you know, if Aberat is now yet, it's probably because Clive has been working on Aberat Four, and he's like rewriting the ending like a bazillion times. And, yeah. Uh, just, just, uh, you know, hang in there. Uh, or, or there might it, be an Aberat Four that's in the garbage. Oh my God! Like, like the uh, Aberat Two that yeah, he threw yeah. away an entire draft and started mm. over. Yeah. Uh, and speaking of special editions, the Thief of Always is getting an anniversary edition. And I believe this one is going to be Seraphim Inc., right? Yes. Yeah, so not uh, not any sm small publisher. It'll be Clive Barker's uh, self-publishing arm, Seraphim Inc. INK, which is sort of a subset of Seraphim INC, which is their main company. I, was, I read, um, that, you know, because Clive Barker, the team has been at the L.A. Comic Con, and they, had, they said they were talking about this. One of the things they were talking about was this edition of... Thief of Always, and it's going to include a lot, a lot of new artwork in it. Very cool. Yeah, I, I, I new artwork. Well, that would be amazing. I mean, I think yeah. the book is already great. The artwork is. Oh, too. Yeah, it's a possibility. Uh, you yeah. never know. Yeah. So we did a, a commentary track for Candyman, um, the first movie, yeah. and we put it out uh, a short time ago. And in it, uh, you guys, we were talking about how we'd like to see Candyman return. But uh, what do you know? A few days after that, we hear Bernard Rose said that he would be interested in making a Candyman sequel. So, Rob, you posted about this. Uh, <laughs> yeah, like the proper sequel he uh, was talking about. 
Yeah. That's interesting I, that he uh, says that. I wonder if he doesn't consider Candyman 2 to be a proper sequel. I don't think he does. I, yeah. I really, it's pretty much like a remake of his the first film in a lot of ways. You did kinda, mention... It, you did mention at one point that he wanted to mix in like Midnight Meat Train with like a Candyman Two kind of thing, and then that never happened. Yeah, that was a. Uh, yeah, I mean, that, I think he was really trying to just do a Midnight Midnight Meat Train adapt, adaptation. Right. Right. To do I, that. I wonder what I wonder what his new uh, idea would be. Yeah, I don't know. I I personally I'd like to see something like uh, Candyman and Helen together mm -hmm. somehow oh, some yeah. kind of weave that together that you know, would be daniel neat and helen daniel and daniel rubber tie and helen or you can go even crazy do some like i had this idea i was thinking about what i mean set it That's way good. in the future set it way in the future and it's not where mirrors don't exist anymore but somebody, wow. comes, across, somebody comes across a time capsule and it's a damn mirror <laughs> it, talks about, it, talk, it, talk, it talks about the Candyman legend. Oh, uh, <laughs> I was just thinking of something oh crazy. God. That's far yeah. out. <laughs> yeah. Instead of mirrors, people would yeah. have like uh, uh, computers, fancy computer screens, I guess. Um, so anyway, this is what uh, Bernard Rose said. He said, I would love to do the proper sequel. There are all sorts of reasons why it's never happened. I think it would be great. But of course, unfortunately, I don't control the rights. Otherwise, I would just do it. Um, so yeah, he says that fans should talk it up to get Hollywood to take notice, and here we are talking about it and making a commentary track. Yeah. So, and and also so, just recently there was a, a digital EP of the from the Candyman soundtrack uh, released mm -hmm. on iTunes. A piano and violin suite by yeah. Philip Glass. Yeah, which sounds beautiful. I, I bought it and it sounds great. I I, I love it. Mm -hmm. I wish I could get. Uh, the, I recently got a vinyl or a record player, and I've been nice. getting, you know, uh, vinyls, and I'd like to get that Waxworks uh, records uh, release, but, man, that thing's gone. It's expensive because oh, it's out of yeah. print. Yeah. So everybody's asking for, you know, hundreds so of dollars for it. Yeah. So it's probably no longer – it was a limited edition, so it's yeah. – it's you can only get it from, like, people on eBay, I guess. Yeah. And they're that's that's the problem. Price. I think this, the second one's still available, which I, I might get. The second one's got some good, you know, sweets in it. Yeah, if if you can get one vinyl that's really awesome, you should get the uh, Hellbound original uh, uh, vinyl release. Um, I don't think it gets that expensive, but uh, you should look for that one. It's really amazing. Does the this, Hellbound soundtrack. Does the vinyl one also have High Point on it, or is that just the CD? Uh, I think that one just has Hellbound. I think oh. I don't have I don't have my copy with me here. I know the the CD comes with the High Point soundtrack, mm -hmm. yeah, the movie. But uh, I don't remember if the vinyl has. I don't think it does. And anyway, um, so uh, the next uh, news is that, uh, and I think this is not really new news because you guys heard that uh, the CW was going to do um, a Weave World TV show. And this has been going on for the past year or so, or maybe longer. And uh, now they already they already they already said that they were going to change the story because the original story that came out was that it's going to be like this guy that would be working with like a, a chef, it was like a, a chef, a pastry <laughs> chef, and an web app design. developer, a web designer. <laughs> Yeah, a, a pastry chef, and there would be like a house with a door that would lead into Weave World or something. And I was scratching my head listening to that premise, and I was yeah. like, "That's that's well, not." But, but if you if you read their new premise, it sounds exactly the same. They just took all the details out. Right. So there's still a house <laughs> yeah, that that had a portal to another world that then they needed to protect the Earth or from it or something. Yeah. Anyway, now that they have a new writer called Josh Stolberg. He's been brought on board to do a more faithful version of the book, and Clive will be producing. So uh, in this new take on Weave World, two ordinary people find themselves on a quest to find and protect a magical realm and ultimately to save all of humanity from an evil force, which is pretty much generic plot for any fantasy novel ever yeah. <laughs> when you yeah, think about it. This, yeah. Okay. It well, doesn't and, get more generic than this. Uh, and, and at yeah. first, when this news came out, I thought, wait, is somebody, because this has happened before with this particular story that uh, 
somebody sort of changes some wording around on it and it becomes a new story again, even though it's the same old one. So I thought I was wondering yeah. if maybe that was happening again. But we do hear that there's a new writer and that Clive is an executive producer. And I think that's new because the last version of it, I don't think that he was that, that they were impressed. Seraphim was impressed with the, the story synopsis and said that that was the first that, that Clive Barker had heard of it. Well, I'm not particularly impressed with Josh Solberg because, uh, unfortunately, I've seen Piranha 3D that he wrote. <laughs> Me so. too. I have also. Oh, God. That's why he's written. Yeah. I didn't know. No, yeah, I Piranha know 3D, guy. Crawl Space, and Good Luck Chuck. So those oh. are three movies that... I've never even heard of these films. I mean, I've heard of Piranha 3D. Don't was it? Is yeah. It? Oh, Piranha 3D. Is that the... I've seen now there's one that's called Double D. Yeah, that's that's, that's, yeah. that's a yeah. I've seen Prana 3D. It's kind of it's really cheesy and just it was really just so. Yeah. I'm just wishing wishing the best for these projects because Clive Barker's producing, and I really want you know Clive to get some some recognition out there. I just really hope that this is going to be worthy of the book because I really hold the book to heart. Yeah, it's yeah. a beautiful story. Top five. We all have yeah. to reserve our judgment until we watch it, but. Um, but you I know, if they like, if they screw it up, it's never going to happen again. There will never be another wish, like, world TV series. I wish well, HBO and these places would look at you know his books and say, yeah. you know, these are pretty cool. You know, I mean, why yeah. not? Or they do the Games of Thrones, and I mean, I don't mm -hmm. think the Games of Thrones and what would have been made if yeah, you know, they were you know whoever. Well, approached. like you said once, uh, the the CW does have the Arrow and Flash, which are two big successful shows. Yeah. So. There's a chance and, uh, that they will actually. Supergirl, right? Yes. Uh, yeah. Sure. Uh, yeah. yeah, you're. I don't. I can't remember who does that. But anyway, so uh, yeah, let's see what happens with this. Uh, again, these projects sometimes you know they happen. Other times they just stay in limbo for a while and then just kind of fizzle away. Uh, I hope that if this does go forward, it's going to be uh, doing justice to the book. But uh, again, I, I, I wish the best of luck for this project. And uh, Phil and Sarah over at their new site, the Clive Barker Archive, have made uh, Imaginer 4 available to pre-order. So they're pretty much in high gear because I haven't even gotten around to buying Imaginer 3 yet. And, yeah. And now I'm afraid probably these gonna, things... Yeah, probably I'm, working on 5, too. <laughs> yeah, I'm afraid that this runaway elephant is I'm not going to be able to catch up again. Sounds good. I mean, it sounds good to me because... Um, if there's one thing that uh, I was concerned about was that this this series might fizzle out because it was relying too much on on crowdfunding and stuff, but it seems like now, pretty much anybody who started this show this uh, series of books is going to want to continue buying them. So, they're getting more and more people uh, who are guaranteed buyers for the remaining books, which yeah. is a good thing. So they don't have to rely so much on being like you know making Indiegogos or Kickstarters or something right. like that. Right. Yeah. So that's a yeah. good thing. I'm I yeah. I still need to read Imaginer two and then buy Imaginer three and pre-order Imaginer four. <laughs> <laughs> it's gonna all be worth it in the end when you yeah, see yeah. all eight volumes spelling Imaginer on your uh, on your shelf. That is I really love the cover for this one. This has got a great cover with the two guy or it's like two. It looks like two men and they're sharing oh, yeah. some kind of like yeah that's it's like that's... they're sharing image vision. It's like. But I can't. I can't remember what it looked like. Oh, here it is. I know that. I know that picture you're talking about. It's like they're cities. Sketch. It's like they're cities, and yeah. like uh, they have cities. Oh, their heads, their, right? Their yeah, their heads. heads. Yeah. And they're finding. Uh, they're yeah. sending little missiles at each other uh, from yeah. their, the the giant buildings in their heads. That's yeah. That's a very funny one. I think this came out from. Uh, you remember that series of prints that came out from? What was the name of that gallery that was selling that we talked about it with Don Bertram on on the show? Um, uh, Luna, oh. Luna Seven. Oh yeah, right, right, right. Yeah, I remember this came out as a print from Luna um, years ago, and I think that that's around the time in the early '90s when Clive was starting to do some drawings and paintings for what was called the Book of Hours, and later became the Aberat. So uh, yeah, it's a really cool print. Um, this is also huge news, and I think we've probably we may have talked about it before. But the Scarlet Box is available in the United States. That's yeah, huge. That's, that's, that's tremendous. Really big news. Yeah, uh, a lot of fans were bummed that it didn't get released here first. 
And some or people are, are complaining about the, the price. I think mainly, I, I think it was David was saying it's expensive compared to the to buying the PAL release. Is it? Because now the price yeah. has gone down uh, quite a bit. Uh, actually, oh, really? I was I was I was thinking oh. the same thing. But Rob, you were telling me that sometimes on pre-order things will uh, the price will fall as the pre-order date comes along, and yeah. that happened on Amazon. It was like a hundred and twenty something dollars. It seems yeah. like it went times. down to eighty nine point ninety or something. Oh wow! Yeah, yeah. So you can like get it for ninety bucks. Sometimes they're just guessing when they when they put that pre-order information on there. Right, because they mm -hmm. called it a DVD to start with, and it seems like they just kind of throw junk on the on there just to have a placeholder, and then they yeah. and then they update it as they go along when they learn more information about it. Sure. So it's great that finally a lot of people who are complaining about it are, are finally going to get a chance to uh, not only see the 4K restorations of these amazing movies, but uh, get a chance at buying the set that will come with a hardcover of 200 pages um, of that Phil and Sarah Stokes from Revelations. Uh, games. That was a great yeah. book. The, the, the little book that comes with it about the yeah. production of Hellraiser, which yeah. is the most attractive thing for me in this set. There's yeah. a lot of great stuff on there. Yeah, because I've seen Hellraiser so many times. It's like, <laughs> yeah. am I really going to yeah, get yeah. anything out of a 4K yeah. viewing of Hellraiser? I mean, that may be naive of me to say it, but I guess... The the thing it, it's it's just really a cool set to have because it's going to come with all those goodies and and uh, extras and the book. So yeah, uh, if you buy it from Amazon, it's probably going to be less than less than ninety dollars. So uh, I know not? probably a lot of people are like, "Gosh darn it! I just bought a region free Blu-ray player for you know the Arrow release, and now they're finally putting it out in America." But that's uh, hey, I that's did. Yeah, yeah, that's that's the way but the game I, I want, is played. That's okay. I mean, like, it's a, it, it, you know, I'm just glad the fans are, will be able to experience it. You know, the ones. That, yeah, you know, that's cool. Like y'all, yeah. I, mean, I hope y'all get copies of it. Yeah, I I put it on my Amazon list. I'm hoping for it for Christmas. Cool. <laughs> Very nice. Yeah. Same here. Yeah. Let's see. Let's see what happens. Let's yeah. see what Santa brings. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so, um, oh, speaking of Hellraiser, uh, and we, we got to break this news first with a spe special shout-out thanks to uh, Christian Francis over at, at Seraphim. Uh, yeah. Seraphim Inc. is going, I-N-K again, is going to be self-publishing a brand-new anthology of Hellraiser comics. So That's like huge. It, that's, yeah. that's enormous. Yeah. And, the artwork will include, include art from Christian Francis, uh, or writing from Christian Francis, I think, right? I'm just reading this from a report uh, oh, that okay. from the LA Comic LA Comic Con. It, yeah, okay. I guess. Uh, does he draw too? Uh, he he does kind of Photoshopy stuff, but I don't think he's oh, okay. a I don't think he's a like he draws. I may be wrong. It, it, you, Christian, you can yell at me if I'm wrong. But <laughs> well, we have the entire press release on our website. And uh, I guess I can read a few parts of it. It says, Today, Clive Barker Seraphin Inc. proudly announced Hellraiser Anthology, an original graphic novel based within the world of Clive Barker's Hellraiser at a panel at Stanley's LA Comic Con. Um, we, we were lucky to be given the information to, to uh, uh, report it at the same time as they were doing this over there. So at 2 p.m. on... Uh, when, when was the day that we pu published this, Ryan? Oh, gosh. Uh, it was on the 10th of, um, no, wait, uh, right, I got it right here, on the 29th of October. Yeah. The day, yeah. That's uh, when they did it, and we, we published it. And um, so the, the, they said, uh, uh, Mark Miller said, we chose to publish this anthology in-house for one main reason. It frees us to tell stories that are entirely uncensored. So finally, we're going to be able to see some really, you know, brutal stuff in the, in the in the field of Hellraiser stories, that's going to be completely uncensored, because that's been something that we've we've never had a chance to have anything like that. Because uh, we'll probably one, see hooks going through assholes. <laughs> that'll you know be who knows. Yeah. Uh, so it's going to be distributed via Clive Barker's well not online store at realclivebarker.com, both as a hardcover print edition and as a DRM free PDF download. So that's that's gonna be cool. Yeah. yeah, I'm gonna have to get that. 
the announcement trailer was voiced by Doug Bradley himself. They did yeah. some stuff to his voice to make it sound more like the Hell Priest, and it's really cool. We have that on our blog as well, so go check it out. And uh, looking forward to this. Let's see what comes out. They said uh, spring 2017, so not too far away. That's right. Yeah, so, and that kind of leads into a discussion. The, the, this was just something I kind of, this, this article kind of bugged me uh, from Movie Pilot. It's called uh, Solving the Puzzle Box, How to Bring yeah. the Hellraiser Series Back to Satanic Glory. Yeah, I read that. Uh, uh, what, you posted it on the one note. Get Clive Barker back, which, you know, yeah. I mean, I would love to see the Scarlet Gospels adapted into a, a movie. Mm -hmm. you know, do like, uh, you know, John Carpenter's involved in a new Halloween yeah. movie. He's just producing it. And he's going to do the score. Yeah. You know, Clive Barker, you know, is obviously he's written a script. And, you know, just have him write, write it or, you know, and heavily involved with the creative, you know, input of the film. Well, this my take on this is that this article comes up with three things. One of them is um, expand the mythos. OK, second is get Clive Barker back. And the first th thing that they mentioned is focus on other Cenobites. And here's here's my thing. First of all, this article is the first time I've ever seen an article with hashtags in the in the body of the text. I don't know what <laughs> yeah. what they're supposed to do. Um, but they do have hashtags all over it, like hashtag pinhead, hashtag Doug Bradley. Yeah. So one of the things is they say focus on other Cenobites, but on their expand the mythos paragraph, they they complain that there's not enough pinhead. They say that uh, <laughs> that filmmakers have to realize that pinhead is a major player. He's not the backbone of the story, blah, blah, blah. Uh, you know, though, as a side note, if Pinhead is in it, get Doug Bradley or GTFO. So, okay, I, I agree with expanding the mythos. I would even say that I like the mythos that exists already. I would like to see it be used more. I would like to see Leviathan come back, the Labyrinth come back. Yeah, you know, okay. I would like to know what what's on the, on, on the walls of the that Labyrinth that we see in Hellraiser Hellbound. Um if you know, if you're going to expand it, it has to be something that comes from from either Clive Barker or the, the Scarlet Gospel, something that comes directly from that source. Um, like I wouldn't want to see anybody like expand the, the mythology just out of their own ideas or their own yeah. wanting to leave a mark in the Hellraiser uh, franchise. I want it to be yeah. from Clive Barker. Okay, I agree with their point. Get Clive Barker back, but. On the other hand, I think Clyde Barker may be a little, like, burned out on Hellraiser. I don't know if that's something that he really wants to invest that much into anymore. Well, and he um, tried. He tried to get to come back, and, and he just got kind of blown off, and they they made something potentially crappy again. We don't know. Yeah, yet, but for most of the franchise, he's been yeah. blown off. So yeah. I understand why he would want to do just his own stuff, like his version of Scarlet Gospels, his version of the yeah. Hellraiser comics. He just wants to be in control of that. When you do a movie, yeah. you're... You know, the director's vision nowadays is not as important as it used to be, uh, let's say, 20, 30 years ago. And I'm still, again, one of the things for me that needs to happen so Hellraiser can get back to its own glory is Hellraiser needs to get out of the Weinstein company. Yeah. Okay? yeah. I don't believe that it's ever thing. going to be any good if the Weinsteins are going to be like hiring people who wrote Drive Angry 3D to come up. I mean, we, we did a whole series with Max Lichter of the Pyramid Gallery on bad Hellraiser treatments that <laughs> yeah. never happened. Yeah. yeah. That were actually being considered yeah. by the Weinstein company. Yeah. And things kept were, getting worse each time we would read a new one. Yeah. Well, they were really paying bad. four yeah. and five figures for these treatments and they were fucking horrible. Yeah. <laughs> I'm sorry. I had to say it. Well, and going back to this article, he says, uh, we already know that Pinhead can die. He did in Hellraiser colon Hell on Earth. I mean, first of all, it's Hellraiser 3 Hell on Earth. And second, Pinhead didn't die in that movie. No, no, I read that part. I was yeah. confused. He, he, died, yeah, I was he, he died in, in Hellbound. Bloodline. In, uh, yeah, in, in Bloodline. Blood, Bloodline and in Hellbound. That's right, and in, in Hellbound as well. Yes, that's true. Although he didn't technically die in Hellbound, his evil was left in the torture pillar. pillar yeah. And, uh, oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. Well, that's true. Yeah. Manifest but, you know, he was meant to have... He was meant to have died in Hellraiser uh, to Hellbound. But, uh, yeah, so I don't know. I, this this stuff, these blog articles, you know, they're a dime a dozen, I guess. <laughs> I guess. 
Uh, that's just the truth. I mean, it's just an editorial piece, so there's really not much that I can criticize it for. But, uh, yeah, I, again, for me, there's only one thing that needs to happen so Hellraiser can get back to being good is just get out of the Weinstein company. Well, and it ends on this bizarre note. It says, Hellraiser never shied away from blood and gore. Check out some of the best beheadings in, in horror on the video below. It's like, what has oh, that yeah. got to do with Hellraiser? Yeah, Hellraiser is never about beheading. <laughs> there's there's one beheading right in in uh, in Hellraiser. Yeah, one 8. of the crappy. And yeah, it was terrible. <laughs> yeah. yeah, I know, I know. <laughs> well, wait uh, a minute. There was a there was one in Bloodline, but it was done with some, like a Hellraiser type of vibe to it. Was when uh, the Paul Merchant from uh, that the present little, segment. Yeah, yeah. yeah it, it was cool though because it had like this hell. Uh, this it was this. It felt like it fit. It didn't. I mean, it felt like it was a, a hook with two serrated blades yeah. that would open up, and then they would just retract and and slice through his neck. Exactly. And, that's true. It was like you know the the other one that he's talking about is like feels like a slasher movie. Yeah. Mm -hmm. It was. It was not okay. good. Yeah, Basically, yeah, here, perhaps a sequel can focus on an uprising. A group of young Cenobites, tired of the old ways, wish to raise a little hell of their own. Perhaps Pinhead got tired of the daily grind of dishing out pleasure and pain and hits the road. A sequel done right could focus on the vacuum of power left in his wake and several factions attempting to claim the throne. Well, you know, there's there's a short film by Gary G. Tunnicliffe called... Uh, um, no more souls. No more souls. No more souls. Yeah. It kind of kind of tackles this thing that you're talking about here. Like yeah. Pinhead is old and tired, and you know some Cenobites end up thinking that well, you're too old. Time to retire, Pinhead. So if you haven't seen No More Souls, go check it out. I think you can find it on YouTube. Um, it's an interesting take on what would happen eons after you know Pinhead. Uh, w there will be no more people on Earth. That all the yeah. souls would have been reaped from the face of the earth and pinhead would be bored in hell yeah. so uh, go check it out no more souls and i think we probably talked about this article enough but um is there did you guys have anything else to add on no. that one? okay no, not really, no, I'm yeah, really. Uh, it's it's moviepilot.com and uh it's it you know they 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 put out some interesting articles this one was just a harmless piece of fluff in my opinion but that's yeah. that's fine it keeps people talking about Hellraiser, which is yeah. like a good thing, I guess. So on the site, you can watch out for we have Lord of Illusions audio commentary now, uh, Hellbound audio commentary, and Hellraiser three audio commentary, and Candyman. So we've been pretty, that's right pretty busy doing audio commentaries. Oh. And Ryan, you're working on your Jericho review update, right? Yeah, yeah, and, and in fact, the, the final piece um, is going to be, uh, you know, it, it, what I needed is, is here, so I can I can finally edit this thing, finish editing this thing and put it out. Yep, because we talked to Chris Velasco today uh, yeah. on a Hangout, which we will be placing after this uh, news segment is over. Yeah, yeah, and then, uh, the, and then uh, how, how is it going with the Hellraiser Bloodlines documentary? Oh, yeah. So, um, Rob, you've been trying to get a hold of some of the people who worked in the movie. So yeah, uh, I got people... involved. I, I talked to uh, Pat Skipper, who played uh, uh, Carducci. Mm -hmm. uh -huh. Did a little interview with him that you know I sent to you, so you can maybe use some of his quotes in the documentary. I'm oh, also wow. trying. I've uh, gotten a response from Daniel. How you pronounce his last name? The composer Licht. Is it Licht? Licked, yeah. Yeah. That's cool. Let's see what we can uh, uh, get from, from there. And um, uh, definitely the documentary is coming this year. So uh, before the end of this year, we will definitely have it. I think it's uh, going to be really something special. J Jose's really worked hard <laughs> yeah. on the yeah. credits. He's, he, we, me and Ryan have gotten to see some plug, yeah. pr some early work of it, and it looks really good. Yeah. So I okay, think well, that's going to be cool. Yeah, yeah well, cool. Yeah, it looks really great. I'll do the best I can to, to make an interesting documentary. We'll tackle some of the locations that were used. We'll tackle some of the things that happened during the production, like, uh, you know, set caught on fire, little kid got the mumps. It, it was just a horrible production. <laughs> yeah. But, yeah. Uh, yeah, so it's coming out, um, and uh, we will how definitely long do you think have it, How long do you think it'll be, about an hour? Yeah, it'll probably uh, be about that, like 45 yeah. minutes to, to an hour, I guess. And, nice. Um, 
If you get yeah, much longer, so, then you don't have to call it mini documentary anymore. Yeah, that's <laughs> that's right. Yeah, kind of like a, that's a a TV. Some TV docs are an hour. Yeah, I'm actually transcribing uh, Peter Atkins' uh, interview episode that we did uh, because we talked a lot about Bloodline. So yeah, we're, we're also transcribing it because we're thinking about this idea for a Kickstarter, but that may be too early to talk about right now. But uh, yeah, I mean, we do have a lot of material on interviews, and it would be cool to have some sort of transcription of some of the best interviews. So uh, yeah. we'll keep you posted on that. I was going to send a shout out if you, Pete, Pete, Peter Atkins listens to our podcast sometimes. Yeah. Uh, good bit. Yeah. And I want to send a Pete out. It's okay to listen to our commentary for Hellraiser 3. We were really good to it. So. <laughs> yeah. uh, at least yeah. I thought we were. I mean, yeah. I, I think, thought we I, I think it was. I think it was really fair. Yeah. So I, go I, listen to it. Don't be, you know, scared. Yeah, <laughs> I love yeah. Hellraiser one through four. Those are yeah. my my best Hellraisers, and the other ones are just yeah, I'm not into that at all. But uh, the the first four ones are really cool. Uh, both me and Rob and and Ryan, I guess, we're also fascinated with Bloodline. Uh, Hellraiser three, I think, really opened the floodgates on the Hellraiser franchise, so it's very important. And of course, one and two are, I still consider that to be like a double a double feature that every time I watch one, I have to watch two right afterwards yeah. because they're just a big movie to me. So th thanks for all that, that good writing in, in the Hellraiser franchise, Pete, we love you. I mean, three and four, you know, has got some of the, you know, best writing from, you know, Pinhead. The dialogue is just yeah. so elegant oh, yeah. and, you know, poetic. Well, yeah. we are about an hour in. So I think without yeah. any, any further ado, let's, uh, let's go right to the interview with, um, Chris Velasco. That's right, Chris Velasco, and uh, it's it's a great interview. It it uh, it was really fun. So uh, there you go. I can't wait All to right. hear it. I look forward to hearing it. Today we have a real treat. Joining us is composer Chris Velasco, who scored the 2007 game Clive Barker's Jericho in a record three weeks, as well as a 2014 Made Fire motion comic, The Book of Blood. And he was also the curator for last July's Wonder Common, a solo exhibit of Clive Barker art. But his career has been extremely prolific. He has also composed music for loads of AAA games like Assassin's Creed Unity, Overwatch, Battleborn, The Borderlands series, God of War, and many others, as well as TV and short films. Recently, he scored an entire season for Hulu's show Freakish, uh, Battleborn's DLC Atticus and the Thrall Rebellion, and he has also collaborated with Chet Zar for his exhibit at the Copro Gallery in Santa Monica, Dystopia. So it's a pleasure to welcome to the show Chris Velasco. Hi, Chris. How are you doing? Hey, guys. Good. Thanks for having me. It's, it's, it's wonderful to have you because uh, we, we've been playing um, Clive Barker's Jericho. In fact, Ryan has been doing a video review about the game. And uh, and one of the things that we came up with was it would be great to be able to talk to the uh, to the soundtrack composer. So here we are. Yeah, thanks. It was, it was you know it was the first time I worked with Clive, so really special project for me. So how did that come about? Uh, well, man, there's a real long story of how I <laughs> Clive, and that's how it all initially came about, but. I don't know if you want to hear the whole story or just about um, the game. Uh, oh, sure, whatever you're. Yeah, this is this is kind of a casual conversation, so you know whatever you're comfortable with. Okay. Um, so I grew up as a as a, just a big fan of Clive, and uh, I used to collect a lot of books, and I would go to book signings. So I I met him, you know, first at a book signing, and this is before I even started studying music um and then and then once i got into to music and composing i was still going to these clive barker signings and i started sending him handing him i should say um like a demo cd and you know i'm i hate to think what was on them now and what i was <laughs> <laughs> what i was leading with for clive but i'm sure it wasn't very good uh but he was always just very like genuine and encouraging and you know, I, I'd give him the CD and I'd say, you know, Clive, one day we're going to work together. And, and uh, yeah, he was, 
she said, all right, I hope we do. And, um, and so every, every year or two or whenever he'd have a new book come out and he'd do a signing for it, I'd show up again with an updated CD <laughs> and did this about three times. And then one day in my, uh, this old apartment I was living in, um, I get a, a phone call and it says, you know, blocked caller. And you know, I'm thinking like, oh God, it's, you know, someone trying to sell me something or, <laughs> uh, and I almost didn't pick it up, but I, I clicked it over and, you know, you've heard Clive's voice, you know, he's got a very distinct gravelly. Oh yeah. Yeah. You, you, you couldn't not know it was Clive if you heard him say something. Um, so I pick up the phone, I say hello. And I hear that voice say, is this Chris Velasco? And uh, I instantly knew who it was. And I, I mean, I almost like my legs almost buckled. <laughs> oh man, that is awesome. And it yeah. says, you know, Chris, you've been talking about wanting to work with me for a number of years now. And, and I've, I've got the new video game and I know you work in games now. And, and I thought you'd be a perfect fit. So, you know, are you available and would you like to, to score my game? And that one was actually demonic. Oh yeah. I was going to ask about that. Um, and yeah, it was like best day of my life. I couldn't believe I went from, you know, like fanboy to now working with Clive Barker. Wow. And so that was, uh, I believe that was the first time I went to his house. He, he called me over. He said, let's, you know, let's chat about the project, listen to some music. I'll give you my thoughts. And, and so I went over to his house down into his, his workshop, his big painting room. And, and he was working on, I don't know, a number of like large canvases all at once. And he kind of had his, you know, his clothes were all spattered with paint and uh, he's chewing on a cigar. And, uh, and he, you know, he says, Hey, Chris, if you don't mind, I'm, I'm, I want to keep painting. And, uh, and then he started pulling CDs out and playing them and, and painting something that was, you know, possibly for Aberat. Mm -hmm. and, uh, and we just listened to music and talked about the project and it, it was crazy. So that, that would have been a really cool game had it ever come out. <laughs> did, did you ever get a chance to do any of the music for Demonic or does that always come near the end? No, I never wrote a, a single note for it. Oh, okay. Yeah, I know that I, the, the demos that we've seen don't have any, any kind of musical score yet. Yeah. Or yeah, the footage, they, I guess. Yeah, they just, um, they canceled the game internally without telling Clive. And, and you know, we were having meetings at his house for three days, and they were just, they're too chicken to say from day one. The oh, game man. Is, we're here to tell you it's canceled. They made Clive sit through, you know, four-hour meetings about about this game, and he's getting all worked up, and he's, he's got this big tablet of paper out. He's, he's drawing these ideas, and and he's ripping them up and like crumpling them with them. I was like, "Oh, I'll take that." <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Um, and uh, and then yeah, third day they were wrapping up another like four hour meeting, and Clive was like, "All right, gentlemen, I got to get back to work. Thank you so much. I'm really excited about this game. Like, you know, I'm I'm really pumped. I've been wanting to do another game for so long." And and that's when one of them finally was like, "Uh, the game's not happening." Oh my god! Oh my gosh! And just totally screwed up I, I couldn't believe it it felt for me and I'd only been on the project for three days I felt like I just got kicked in the gut um, right. this was, you know going to be my dream project but man I can't even imagine uh, how pissed Clive must have been holy cow yeah I, I bought an Xbox 360 for that game and <laughs> I kept on every day going to the website looking for updates and it just wouldn't say anything I don't think I don't remember ever a time when they said it was canceled. It just kept on going and going, and, and there was no news. And you know yeah. what's funny is that the only footage that we can see of that game demo is in the background in a TV in the movie Gram Grandma's Boy. Yeah, and someone is playing demonic on on yeah. one of the TVs. Yeah, I a friend of mine was like an extra or something in that movie, and he wanted to go see it. And like, oh, man, it doesn't look very good. But okay. <laughs> and then they played some of – I didn't know that Demonic was in it. And and I saw it, and 
that's right when I was supposed to be working on it, you know, and I was kind of like sat up in my seat like, oh my God, it's demonic. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> I think in the movie they were playing it on an original Xbox, which doesn't really make any sense, but. <laughs> so uh, one of your first soundtrack uh, uh, big breaks was for Battlestar Galactica, right? But you're, so Jericho was your big solo project scoring an entire soundtrack. Am I correct? Uh, oh, as a solo project, maybe because I worked with a write, another writing partner for many years. He, he who shall not be named. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> right. But you, uh, it, what sort of, um, let me see. So, um, Nowadays, a lot of composers use, use digital platforms to compose their music. So how does software like Logic or Cubase support you during the composition process? Can you describe your digital audio workstation for our music nerd listeners? <laughs> um, yeah, I just I use Cubase. I have been ever since I started composing. And you, um, I'm always working, so it's up right now, but you uh-huh. know, with the two... I can't show you what's on the screen because it's in for an unannounced mm-hmm. project, and maybe somebody mm-hmm. could. <laughs> yeah, yeah, no problem. Uh, but so I just put on horns. So. so, you know, sounds like a horn. Um, switch over to the cellos and basses. Ooh, creepy. <laughs> That's awesome. Um, so yeah, I've just got a whole template set up with every member of the orchestra, every articulation that they can play, and um, that, and choir, and piano, and um, percussion, and I just uh, you know switch between the the sounds and, and play, record everything in myself, and go back in and tidy up the the MIDI files, and mm-hmm. um, and off it goes. That's fantastic. But for Jericho, you actually got to work with a choir of about 30 voices. Uh, I think you recorded it at Skywalker Sound. Uh, yeah, that's true. Yeah. Uh, you work with Leslie Ann Jones, a multi-Grammy award-winning engineer. How, how was that experience like? Uh, Leslie is awesome. I've actually recorded maybe like eight or nine times up there. Oh, wow. Mm-hmm. Um, yeah, Leslie is one of the, the coolest people I know. She's she's great. She's a great person, and she's a great engineer, of course. Amazing. Uh, did you get to see any gameplay of the game, uh, Jericho, as you were composing, or were you just given concept art? Um, no, I could actually play the game because um, it was so late in the process. Mm-hmm. I actually replaced another composer on this game. Oh. So we didn't. Hold on, how did I get on board Jericho? But um, when I did, it was because Clive again had personally hired me to score this game. And uh, and then the company that was making it decided that they didn't want me and they were going to use somebody else and just not tell Clive. <laughs> and, then, uh, <laughs> and then at the very end of production, they... Um, the game developers had a meeting at, at Clive's house to go over it and see what he thought of the game. Are there any changes you want to make before it's you know too late? And, and he made he had some notes, and then he said, "And but what is this? You know, what is this music I'm listening to?" He said, "Oh, well, that's the score." And he said, "This is what Chris Velasco wrote." And um, and they they're like, "Well, we didn't hire Chris. We <laughs> no. <laughs> this meeting, but I know two people that were." And they both uh, said that that Clive like flew into a rage, <laughs> oh, and, and told them that if they didn't call me, and if I wasn't hired to rescore the whole game in the next forty eight hours, he was taking his name off the project. Oh um, wow! Yeah. Uh, so that is the one and only time I've had my own, you know, eight hundred pound gorilla in the room. Yeah. Oh, that must be that must be something to have a Clive Barker for a champion. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> That's cool. That's why, well, that's why I only had three weeks to score the whole game. Oh. 
Um, is it typical though that you get to play the game while you're, you know, to while you're coming up with the score? Or do you usually have to kind of use your imagination and look at concept art? Yeah, the, the latter. Okay, I, I rarely. Well, it seems um, like it shows because the 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 music really kind of flows well with the game. Um. Well, yeah, that's that's the idea, and then hopefully we've I've uh, written it in a way that that the, can be easily implemented to actually do that. Uh, half the work is, you know, the audio engineer um, implementing the the score so that it it makes the game feel seamless. Mm -hmm. actually uh the fact that you mentioned there was a previous soundtrack for uh jericho kind of flows into my next question that i had was that temp score has always pretty much been present in movies uh is there an equivalent in game composing because i, I see the need for it in the editing process for film because most films nowadays are practically cut to the music um mm. but for games this doesn't seem like the, seems like the mechanic of the game is different and so um, they tend to use different techniques for uh, game composition, like uh, looping the same music or making music that's that can be put on the loop or something. Um, so yeah, my my question is: Do games have temp score, or usually it's just go into composition and make the the score? Yeah, there's they don't really have a temp score because you know, like you were talking about it, it's not um, the game isn't cut to music at all, right? Right. Uh, uh, since and being nonlinear, it's it's tough to to temp in music for a game as well. Uh, but I usually do get a, a list of here's what we like, here's what we're listening to while we're making the game, kind of thing, and um, and I'll just kind of use that as a as a basic template of of the direction I have to be going. Awesome, awesome. Um, so. What sort of notes did Clive give to you when you were composing Jericho? We just played, uh, again, had another listening session at his house, and he just played me a lot of music that he liked, and he, and he told me a bit about the story, and, he, um, and we talked about how it had kind of religious connotations to it. And, and so I thought, oh, but, you know, you've got to have the choir singing in Latin. If, uh, mm doing that and and you know with only a couple weeks or whatever to score the score mix and deliver the game um there was really no time to have a, a recording session but i just i really wanted that choir and when i <laughs> i guess the company had been told um don't piss clive off like just whatever chris wants just let him have it <laughs> oh that's cool and I didn't yeah. do that until afterwards, uh, or I would have asked for a, a whole orchestra, but but I asked if we could get the money to do a choir. And, uh, yeah, they just, like, so quickly said, yes, that sounds great. Uh, oh, wow. So, yeah, I, I actually started writing the, the whole score. We did this recording very soon in the process. Um where I just recorded them doing a lot of long chords and a lot of kind of aleatoric, you know, weird clustery uh, stuff. And and I did have a couple of melodies, so we recorded them doing that. Um, I had them re record some actual uh, Gregorian chants. And uh, then we just had them do weird effects and whispers and chanting. And, um, so I got this whole big library of choir stuff. And then I used that as kind of a foundation to get started at writing. Oh, wow. So you did that first. Yeah. So going back a little ways to, um, you were saying that you had first met Clive at a book signing. Do you remember which book? <laughs> no, I, I don't. I guess it, it might be, I don't know, one of the books of the art. I, I can't. Oh, okay. I don't. No, I, I can't remember. <laughs> I really love the firstborn theme uh, because it opens with, uh, I believe it's Greek. It, it, it's just this little child's voice singing Kyrie L.A. song, which means Lord have mercy. And it's just so creepy. It's just an excellent opening to the game. Yeah. It's one yeah, thank you. Um, so if you've been playing it, you know that the firstborn. Oh, have you seen the firstborn yet? 
Have yeah. You played the game? Oh, yeah, yeah. Yeah, yeah we've yeah. played the game it's several times. It's so old, I know yeah. that maybe I don't have to issue a spoiler alert. This no, game. no, it's okay. Uh, okay, so, you know, the firstborn was really, like, in the body of a child. Um, so I thought that that would be cool to get a boy soprano um, to, to sing his theme. It works so well because it's just this singular voice, almost no instruments, and it's it, it goes towards the whole mythology of the firstborn because he was created first by God, and he was a soulless creature, and then God locked him away in by himself in a little dimension, and that's almost like him singing Lord Have Mercy, and it's amazing, amazing opening for the game. I really enjoyed it. <laughs> Thanks. It, it also had the, uh, the duality of my, my wife's daughter is named Kyrie, and I oh. was, you know, however much younger back then, how many years it's been, but uh, but brought her up to Skywalker too, and I, um, and so there was get seen as like, check it out, I put your name in, in Clive Barker's Jericho, and <laughs> that's great, that was awesome, and she was just kind of like, oh, <laughs> <laughs> that's very cute, um. So in 2014, you scored the Made Fire motion comics adaptation of the, the story, The Book of Blood. Um, so this was, again, you were working with Clyde Barker. How was that? How did that opportunity came about? I've just been in touch with them, you know, throughout the years after Jericho and uh, got to know his, the new, you know, vice president of Seraphim, Mark Miller. Yeah. yeah. So I got to know, you know, Mark very well. And, um, yeah, they just called my, my agent up, I think, and said, we're doing this, this thing. We're doing motion comic of, of books of blood. There's going to be a comic for every single story in the books of blood, plus possibly a couple new ones that Clive was going to do. Ooh. Um, hopefully that was okay to say that. <laughs> oh, yeah. No, yeah, it's been announced. Uh, it's been announced. Um. Uh, so, yeah, they just called up and said, do you want to do it? And I guess I do. <laughs> yeah, that's amazing. Yeah, I love the Book of Blood soundtrack. It just added the perfect accompaniment to the visual experience. Uh, the subtle piano notes were very chilling. And the, the credits music box theme reminded me a little bit of Hellraiser. Um, th that climax with the choir at the end of the story just gave me goosebumps. I really enjoy that. And I hope to see more... Uh, more of the motion comics come out. I think the next one that was announced at some point was the Midnight Meat Train. Uh, it's still... Uh, yeah, so we we already did that. And oh. um, there's a... We're hoping that it takes off again. Books of Blood kind of got put on hiatus. Mm -hmm. um, the format, you know, Made Fire, they just... It just wasn't moving enough. Like, enough, not enough people were, were reading it. So... Mm -hmm. You know, maybe it's, uh, I don't know. I, I haven't really heard too much about after that initial kind of, um, all the cool things called motion comics. Like, it seems like it kind of died down. So, I don't know. We're, we're exploring other options, but I do think it's coming back out. Oh, good. Yeah. yeah. So um, with these with the video games that you score, do you, uh, do you play through them after you get, after the retail release comes out? Oh, I, I'm sorry. I was reading a text that the came. Oh, no um, problem. Uh, do you, do you, you yeah? Do you read the? Do you play the games that you score after they oh, come yeah, out they, in retail? I always play the games. Um, and if it, if it's good, like like Jericho, um, I will play the whole thing. And you know, some games get get an hour of gameplay or so. Oh yeah, yeah. So I do play them all. In July, you curated and presented the Wonder Common uh, Clyde Barker exhibit at Santa Monica's CoPro Art Gallery, which is a place where you've you've done several, um, you've been involved in several events there. Um, so, how was that experience of curating a Clyde Barker uh, exhibit and immersing yourself in such a prolific body of work? <laughs> um, you can't even believe how prolific it is until you actually <laughs> yeah. see the room. Um, it's it's kind of like, you know, the end of Raiders of the Lost Ark when they're pushing the, the Ark into that giant warehouse with just boxes. Perhaps. Yeah. Uh -huh. That's that's kind of what Clive's art room is like. You just... <laughs> it's yeah. just never seen canvases, but all perfectly stacked up 
and labeled uh, with a, a QR code so that they could scan it and find out exactly like what it is and all the details. And um, but yeah, it's it's immense. And trying to pick out pieces for the show, um, that was that was super fun. But but oh my god, I just <laughs> I felt bad for the guy that had to put everything back because these things are gigantic and yeah. pull it out of the slot. And they're they're wedged in there so tight you don't you don't want to put it back in because I'm afraid that you know the paint you're gonna scrape it yeah. yeah. Uh, so I was just pulling things out and and just leaving them out and stacking them out on the walls and um, it was awesome. <laughs> uh, and you ended up doing some other stuff with other artists that uh, exhibit at the Copro Gallery. So I guess it, it became like a place that you like to work with. Yeah, I've been. Um, I got into collecting art uh, mm -hmm. a few years ago and uh, just got to know a lot of the artists too, so the ones that are local and just sort of getting involved in this art community and um, yeah, this, I, I, I purchased a, a few pieces from this Copro gallery and got to know the, uh, the guys that run it pretty well. And I asked him one, uh, two years ago, said, hey, I've got this idea for a for an art show called Roadside Attractions. And it's going to be kind of like this dark carnival, like rolled into town and, um, you know, just featuring all this dark art. And it's going to be eclectic. It's going to be like 20 or 30 different artists. And there's no real theme other than something that you might find in this like dark roadside attraction um and that show did really well and, and had a great turnout and so i've done a few of these shows with them now and then i uh, actually called up uh mark miller and i i said you know i'm i would love to do a solo clive barker art exhibit there hasn't been one in a long time and uh and i know that i can get copro gallery to do it mm -hmm. They just, they're like, that sounds awesome. Just go, just do it. Sure, and sure. That, <laughs> that's all it took. Yeah, and and you've recently also uh, did that uh, dystopia with Chet Zar, who worked in movies like Darkman, right? Uh, yeah, Chet is one of the artists I collect, and uh, we become good friends. And uh, he had this really amazing solo show, Dystopia, like you said, and I mean, he even did a Kickstarter to, to get it money to decorate the, the outside of the, of the gallery. There were like smokestacks and there were creatures walking around and there was a, um, these like rusty pipes that were actually spewing out water. And, and uh, wow. it, it was amazing. It was just, it was so crazy. But uh, I asked Chet if uh, he thought about having like a, some kind of ambient soundtrack to the whole thing. And, and he goes, Oh yes, that would be awesome. And, and he was actually going to do it himself first because he plays, uh, he plays some instruments and, and then like two days before the show, uh, he called me and he said, Oh man, there's no way I don't have time to do it. Can you, can you do it? And I'm like, Oh yeah, there's only two days, but okay, I'll, I'll do something. And how long do you want it to be? And, I thought it was going to be like a minute or two minutes. We just loop it. Um, he goes, I don't know, something like 20 minutes would be cool. And uh -huh. <laughs> like, what are you talking about? Um, but I did do like that's a, a sweet track. Yeah. And, um, and we looped it and, and uh, it was cool. It really helped add to the atmosphere of, of Chet's show. We're actually right, cool. talking about um, doing a project together. It's like a disc with um just with his art and that soundscape kind of going i don't <laughs> i don't know i think his his fans would like it oh yeah for sure i can see that you collect a lot of art because it's obvious when you look in the background of your camera we can see a lot of amazing art art on your walls so it's very impressive stuff uh i have one last question about the composing process um games like ubisoft's assassin's creed unity uh, that you've done the soundtrack for the DLC, Dead Kings. 
they usually have more than one composer for the whole game. So especially with the expansions and the like. Um, is there, is there, how, how does the Ubisoft, for example, make this all work you, sound, sounding unified? Uh, does each composer do his own thing or do you guys listen to each other's uh, work or, or is it, yeah? I've, I've done quite a few projects where there were a number of composers. Like right. uh, God of War always had like at least four composers. Yeah. Um, Borderlands. Had a, had a few, uh, and no, typically we don't listen to each other's music. Hmm. <laughs> uh, I think everyone just wants to do their own thing, and and um, you know we get direction from the audio director, mm -hmm. so it's kind of his job to make sure everything is is unified. If he's gonna juggle, you know, a number of composers, but you know you just get your direction and you you do uh, the best you can and. Um, and yeah, you know, at the end of the day, it all it all sounds pretty good. Yeah. Uh, on uh, for Jericho, you released the Jericho soundtrack, or or someone released the Jericho soundtrack on iTunes, so people can can buy it and download it. Is that normal? Or did, does, does that happen for other video game scores? Uh, yeah, I'd say most games are getting getting uh, iTunes releases these days. There's, uh, you know, it's such a popular medium and. And people really love the soundtracks now. And I mean, there are concerts all over the world playing video game music. So, yeah, it kind of used to be few and far between for a, for a soundtrack to come out, but but now it's it's pretty common. Yeah, especially on Bandcamp, you can see a lot of composers that do uh, soundtracks for indie computer games. Yeah. Um, you know, like like the Binding of Isaac or other games like that. They usually end up for sale on websites like Bandcamp yeah. or iTunes. Right. Yeah. Um, so what upcoming projects are you working on right now that you can tell us about? I can talk about almost nothing. <laughs> That's okay. okay. <laughs> uh, I'm trying to think. Oops. Um, no. Uh, all, I can all I can say are things that have been announced already and and the only thing I, I think I've worked on that has been announced where they allow me to say I'm writing music for it uh, is Volition's new game uh, the guys that did like Saints Row mm -hmm. yeah, the game mm -hmm. is called Agents of Mayhem oh, Agents, Agents, of Mayhem. Agents of Mayhem so and that's been announced but it's not out yet right right I, I don't know if it's out this year or next year but um, it looks really cool and and the music is fun. We recorded, um, recorded that live also. Cool. Well, we'll watch out for that one. And yeah, uh, I, I wish I could tell you about some of the other stuff because um, I'm pretty excited about them. But nope. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, we'll hear about it when it comes out. Yeah. So after Jericho, there was talk of a Jericho sequel, but then that all kind of sort of fizzled away. Was there, um, were you involved in that in any way, or was there any, did, had you heard anything more, more than just what Clive Barker said in interviews? I think the game just didn't, just didn't sell well. Yeah. Um, I, a lot of people didn't care for it. I played it all the way through, and I actually thought it was a great game. I really liked it. I, I when I got done, I played it again on a higher difficulty, and then again on the last. So I I got all the thousand points on the Xbox 360. Yeah, so that that's going to be cool. Uh, we're going to put part of this interview on the uh, the video review that Ryan is doing because you've recorded the whole game through, and you're going to use that to make your video review. Yeah, yeah. All right. Wow, you've got a recording of you playing all the way through. Yeah, well, I'm not going to make people watch all of that, but. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Some of it was me falling asleep and like bumping my face into a wall over and over again. <laughs> all right. That's funny. Um, all right. So Ryan, do you have any more questions? Uh, no, no. I think this was great. Thank you so much for joining us. Yeah. Oh, you guys want to see Pinhead? Oh, yeah. 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 All right. Hold on. Um, can I turn the camera around on this? I don't think so. Is that is that the iPad? Yeah. Yeah. Oh, oh my god. Oh, holy cow. 
That's it amazing. Is. Wait, so, let me you can see how huge it is. Oh my god. That's from the 25th anniversary um Hellbound Heart. Uh yeah, they use that for the cover. Or 20th anniversary, I think. Right, that from 2006. I am very jealous. <laughs> wow, that's amazing. That's a really cool piece. Thank you so much for uh, giving us a peek of that amazing painting. And I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to end this by quoting what Clive Barker said about you once for Jericho. He said, It pleases me to no end to announce that once again, Chris Velasco will be providing the soundtrack to my worlds. Not only is Chris one of my favorite composers, he's one of my favorite people. His work on Jericho was unparalleled, and what he has brought to Books of Blood is, I assure you, nothing sort of astonishing. Prepare yourselves for an experience the likes of which you've never seen. This is what he said in 2014 when Made Fire's Book of Blood came out. That Clive, he's a nice guy. <laughs> he's awesome. Well, it's deserved, and we're looking forward to seeing more Clive Barker stuff with your, uh, with your music. Yeah, cool. Thank you. I, I hope there will be. All right. All right. Well, thank you very much for joining us. Yeah, and thank you so much. I hope you had a good time on the Clive Barker podcast. Yeah, absolutely. Thanks, guys. Have a good one. You too. You can find the show notes for this page and lots of Clive Barker news and features at www.clivebarkercast.com. Leave comments there or get them directly into the podcast by clicking the Send Voicemail tab on the right. Please follow us on Twitter at BarkerCast or at Occupy Midian. Like us on Facebook and join the Occupy Midian Facebook group. You can listen on the site or subscribe to the podcast on iTunes, Stitcher, Libsyn, TuneIn, Pocket Cast, Google Play, and Double Twist. Subscribe to our YouTube channel as well. Please take a couple of minutes to leave us a review on iTunes. It means the world to us and helps us spread the word about Clive Barker. The Clive Barker Podcast, or BarkerCast, is an independent editorial fan site and podcast that is not affiliated with or under contract by Clive Barker or Seraphim Films. This is a labor of love by the fans for the fans. Thanks for listening.